Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to day two of ImageCon. While we wish we could be together in person this year, we're excited to host you in this virtual format. We have an exciting day of sessions planned and I can't imagine a better way to kick things off. My name is Julie Greenwood. I head up communications and customer marketing here at Cloudinary, and I'm so honored to welcome Whitney Johnson, VP of Immersive and Visual Experiences for National Geographic. In her role, Whitney leads the visual and immersive staff overseeing photography, video, Instagram, and podcast teams. Before National Geographic, she was at The New Yorker for nearly a decade, first as a picture editor and then as the director of photography, where she championed photojournalism and contemporary media. Her work has earned her numerous awards, including a Peabody in 2011. We're going to break for a short visual overview of National Geographic, then we'll be back for our conversation and then to take your questions. To participate, simply enter your questions in the chat window to the right of your screen. And with that, we'll play the video. Whitney, welcome to ImageCon. Thank you so much for being here. It's great to have you. Thanks so much for having me, Julie. I'm really um, honored to be a part of ImageCon this year. I want to talk about um, National Geographic, obviously one of the most widely read magazines of all time. Um, I think for many of us here, it's probably safe to say you have the dream job, the ultimate dream job for those of us who care about photography and images. Um, and for a magazine with a history as rich as Nat Geo's, um, I expect it's seen its fair share of change and evolution. So I wanted to start by digging into 2020, um, certainly a transformative year, incredibly difficult and challenging for all of us, but it also presented us with a lot of ways to create and connect. Um, can you share some of the challenges that you and your teams faced during those early days in particular, how it impacted or redirected the work, how you were thinking about delivering experiences online? Yeah, I mean, I was, um, I'm always reminded when I watch that video of the work that we do, that our photographers are always going to great lengths to make the pictures that they make for us. You know, you saw our photographers underwater there. You saw our photographers, Amy Vitali, dressed in a panda costume so that she could actually be one with the pandas while she made those photographs. But 2020, you're right, really presented challenges that we were, you know, in so many ways unprepared for. Um, and I, I think during that time, one of the most critical things we learned was that we were not only, as we always do, thinking about kind of the safety um, and health of our photographers in the field, but as some of our photographers shared with me, you know, I had photographers who had covered Ebola the year previously, and 
she realized during the pandemic that she was now thinking more about the safety of the communities that she was working in than her own safety. So that was a that was a big shift for us. Um, but even more so, I think that 2020 really accelerated a change in the kind of storytelling that we've been doing here at National Geographic. Now, like you hinted at, this is a change that has been kind of underway for quite a number of years. You know, but it used to be that we would send photographers from headquarters here in in Washington, D.C., out into the world to make pictures. Um, Now, we've certainly started this evolution over the last five years, but this really accelerated during the pandemic. We started working with photographers based all over the world, telling stories in their own countries, in their own backyards. We were just unable to send photographers because of all the restrictions um, across countries. Um, And this, this kind of had a silver lining, you know, for... In a way, we were really able to get photographers to engage in telling stories about their own places. And, you know, we're a global brand. And now more and more, the work that we're doing is done by contributors who really reflect um, the world that we live in. You know, in terms of distribution of content, you know, this, of course, put, you know, there were a lot of challenges, but also opportunities. I think we we tried to be more... um, creative, I would say, and more innovative with how we were delivering content. So we really leaned into our audio storytelling, where we focus on how photographers got their start. And we also had a lot of fun um, working with augmented reality over over 2020, while we were all trapped at home, kind of taking our ourselves and our audience to other places through AR and VR. That's a great segue into um, one of the experiences you delivered last summer. Um, I know you took through AR an experience on Instagram. You took viewers um, to the top of Everest. They were able to really sort of suit up as a as a climber, see their breath, um, and even share selfies from the summit. Can you share a bit about that experience, what it was like to create and pull off, and then how participants responded to it? Yes. Um, <laughs> that was a lot of fun to put together. So, um, you know, I think one thing that I think about a lot almost daily is how do I take the legacy of National Geographic photography and storytelling, but really bring it into the 21st century. So augmented reality for me is not just a gimmick, but it's really a way to reach audiences where they're at. So what we wanted to do was um, take this rich storytelling that we've been doing for the magazine, that we've been doing for our digital platforms and see how we could extend that into these other arenas. So we worked with many of the assets that we were um, collecting when our climbers and photographers and our expedition team went up Everest. Um, We took 360 video and we were able to really uh, translate that into this rich and narrative experience in AR. Like you said, you were able to suit up and as you climbed up the uh, the mountain with the expedition, your gear changed. Um, and then you were able to take a selfie at the top. And for us, that was in a way to not just bring the narrative storytelling element that is so critical to National Geographic storytelling into AR, but also to, I think, reflect um, the reality of that medium, right? And, and we were delivering this content in Instagram Taking selfies is obviously a huge part of that culture. And so we wanted to make sure that the experience that we were building was both true to National Geographic, but also really um, reflected the platform on which it was being built. Um, This was a massive success, you know, something like 50 million people engaged with this content. Um, Like I said, it was distributed across Instagram, where we have a massive reach of over 180 million people. Um, And it led us to actually engage in some other augmented reality experiences on that platform. Um, The other really exciting one that we did this past year was collaborating with NASA and taking our audience actually to the surface of the moon. And what was interesting about putting this experience together was that we wanted to both um, make sure that we could deliver this experience in real time Um, as the mission, you know, as the rover set down on Mars. So we had to build as much of the experience in advance as we could. But we also wanted to make sure that the imagery stayed true to one of the kind of core tenets of National Geographic, which is that we're a fact-based organization. So we'd worked extremely closely with the NASA scientists, and we waited until the rover sent the image back 
to Earth. And then we put that image into this AR experience and we were able to launch it on our Instagram feed the following day. So we were almost in real time taking people to the surface of the moon alongside the rover. And I think that that's, you know, it to me, this is just you know, this is just an extension of the storytelling that National Geographic has been doing for 133 years, but we're just taking it to these other platforms and really trying to reach our audience where they're at. Yeah, I think it's so important as, you know, I mean, the power of digital experiences carries new meaning today. Like you said, we're able to um, really remove barriers and take people to places that they would not be able to go otherwise. Um, You know, for many months, obviously, we literally relied on digital content and digital means of, of connection. We, um, you know, connected digitally for work, for school, for entertainment, um, and social change and activism. Um, and in many ways it removed barriers, um, and provided a certain level of equity that I think, um, when technology, technology is working, um, working well and as it should does, um, what in your mind has changed, like the, the shift that happened last year, um, the acceleration of these changes, and, and what elements will remain the same? Yeah, that's an interesting question. You know, in so many ways, I'm not sure that the pandemic necessarily introduced new opportunities as much as it just um, reinforced opportunities that were already there. Um, like you said, I think one thing that we think about a lot here at National Geographic is um, is what we've called in the past sort of armchair travel or armchair tourism, you know, the ability to take people through the pages of our magazine to these other places. Um, And the digital space just allows us to do that in a much more fully immersive way. Um, You know, and, and for the past year and a half, we've been forced into this space. But the reality is that into the future, there are, there, there are all kinds of reasons that someone might not be able to travel to Machu Picchu, right? It could be economic reasons. Um, it could be sort of health reasons. Um, I have photographers who are capable of climbing to the summit of Mount Everest. I am not. <laughs> so I really value these opportunities. I'm not going to Mars. You know, I value these opportunities where we can actually take people to kind of the furthest reaches, um, not just of the earth, but beyond as we did with Mars. Um, and, and I think one thing that we've thought about a lot, so, so there's kind of that equity, um, you know, value, I think Mm -hmm. there's also one thing that we've talked about a lot here at National Geographic is, um, you know, some of these landscapes that are, that people want to visit are really, they're over touristed. Um, and these can be quite fragile landscapes. And so we've, thought about the possibility of being able to take people to these places. And then maybe they don't have to set foot there themselves. Maybe that checks off the bucket list for me having to go to Machu Picchu. um, And I can also then play a part in protecting that fragile landscape for future generations as well. I mean, the flip side of that, of course, um, is that some of these countries and economies really depend on that tourism. So that's a question that kind of remains unresolved, I think, for us. Yeah, I think that's that's a really good point and a consideration. And I am sure, you know, hopefully it balances out, right? The those that can experience it digitally um, are not going to prevent the the you know the people that would have traveled to Everest probably getting there, but um, you know, broaden someone's awareness around sort of the need to really sort of conserve and save these sacred places. I also think there's such an opportunity for shared experiences in a way that, um, which is another opportunity through the digital space. I mean, we're here today across the country together and with the audience, um, but we can also experience travel with, you know, I can travel to Machu Picchu with my father from Santa Fe and we can do it all from uh, the, the safety of our, you know, security of our living room. So I I think that that's an interesting way of thinking about the connections that we're able to make in the digital space as we um, share these experiences as well. It doesn't have to be an isolating experience here in the Zoom world. It can actually also be a space that brings us together um, socially and to have these shared experiences. I love that. 
Um, I want to dig in on video. Um, Obviously, you know, video, sort of the demand for and consumption of just exploded, accelerated last year. We saw video use on our platform more than double in 2020. um, And that continues. Um, As you mentioned previously, like these things were happening, right? This, the pandemic did not um, cause these shifts. Um, there was an acceleration, but I think sort of the, the pace of it was quite surprising in some ways. Um, what are you seeing and how, how are you and your teams managing sort of the increased appetite or demand for video? Yeah, I think, as you say, this has been a transition that's been taking place over, you know, a number of years. Um, We've certainly been working with our, from a content perspective, working with our photographers to really develop other tools in their toolbox, right? Whether that's audio or video um, or even illustration as a form of storytelling. Um, and, And I think, though, we still think a lot about the, you know, the end product for each of these assets, right, that our photographers are out collecting. And I can't put a video in the magazine. I do need still images that are sort of fixed in your mind that stick with you. In the digital space, we've seen, like everyone else, we really need motion content to be able to draw our audiences in um, and get their interest and hook them into a story. So that is something that we have been thinking about across our platforms, not just in kind of the traditional dot-com space, but definitely in our interactions with our third parties, um, Instagram. We've even launched a TikTok feed here at National Geographic uh, during the pandemic. Um, And that is, of course, a space that really reflects this um, growing hunger for for video. Uh, Interestingly, too, about National Geographic, I mean, Obviously, we have the magazine. We also have our channel. Um, and, you know, we are streaming all kinds of content across Hulu and Disney+. Plus. So I think for the teams that I run here on the um, magazine side, we're thinking um, also always thinking about in terms of video, what is the unique opportunity that video can offer and provide in the digital space, reaching people on these platforms, reaching people on their mobile devices, um, that short form content that people may engage with in a very different way than they're engaging with when they sit down on their couch and want to engage with a Netflix special. Yeah, I mean, I think we've, you know, there, I don't know how many more creators, influencers over this past year, right? But everyone today has the opportunity to really become, you know, their own publisher. It's never from TikTok um, to other platforms. It's really never been easier. Podcasts and cooking shows, um, lots of user-generated content. Um, What are you thinking um, about this new format? And when you're thinking about a story, can you take us through what the process is like when when you're thinking about a story and how it might take shape? That is such a big question. Um, it's hard to answer in just a few minutes here. But I, I think more and more we're thinking about as we develop a story, you know, of course, we're thinking about what is the format that story will take in our printed pages of our magazine. But we are really thinking about our responsibility to telling the story across all of these digital platforms and the need to um, create and acquire different kinds of content to really um, meet the appetite of the audience in each of those spaces. And You know, I I think as more and more people have access to creating their own content, we obviously see in some of these spaces that there is a desire and a demand for um, a less polished product, right? You know, we can we can think of Instagram and TikTok as distribution channels for our editorial content. They certainly are, but they're also an opportunity for us to pull back the curtain on you know, how the sauce gets made here at National Geographic. What is it really like to be a photographer in the field? And we found that these opportunities where we have our photographers engage directly with the audience, um, sort of be on screen in a selfie style video on Instagram. Um, our audience just, uh, they, they love that. And we've tried to bring that element of the storytelling um, into our storytelling from the beginning. The other thing I would say is that National Geographic is, you know, synonymous with photography. I think you know, you see the yellow border, you know, you're talking about visuals, you know, you're talking about photography. But I think it's also important to remember that 
technology has been equally important to us here at National Geographic. And one of the things that has made and enabled our photographers to get some of the pictures that they get, to get pictures that no other photographer can, is because we've worked um, to build custom cameras that allow our photographers to get into places that other photographers can't. So I think that, you know, as we think about building out these stories, there's a really creative storytelling team from the beginning that involves the photographer, it involves the photo editor, it involves our photo engineer. So we can say, what is the best way to tell this story? And what are all the tools in our toolkit that we have access to that will allow us to, to, to show this story to people in a way that they've really never seen before? Yeah, I think as, you know, as this evolution continues and, um, you know, there's, there is for a lot of people, as you say, sort of this nostalgia for all things photography and images. And I share it as someone who grew up with a film camera, developing my own film and making prints in a dark room. Um, there's something sacred about that. And it's easy to think that as things continue to become digitized, that maybe we're losing something. Um, but I, I, you know, if are we, you know, is it is it is the the thing that makes the image special? Or are we reducing its value when it's everywhere? Um, what do you what do you think about that? This is a question that I just love because it's one that is asked of me quite a bit. Um, and, you know, as a journalist, as a storyteller, as a content maker, I think our not only our job, but our desire should be to have our stories, our images seen by as great of audience as possible. And I think that we need to be realistic about where we're putting those images and how we're reaching these different audiences in these different places. I mean, the majority of our content is seen by our audience on mobile telephones, mobile devices. So I, I don't, but I'm asked, is that you know, doesn't it break your heart when you see one of these gorgeous images reduced to a two inch size? Well, I don't think so. I think that it's important that people are seeing that story and engaging with it. And there's other tools that we can use to build out that story in a more immersive way and a visually rich way. That also doesn't preclude it from being a big, beautiful print in a, in a museum gallery either. I think that, you know, we see this with our photographers that they really the most successful ones are able to embrace this idea that their work can and should be seen across all of these platforms. I mean, I think as we've talked about before, uh, you know, an image is just a photograph until we think about how we're going to package it up in a way that we can deliver it to our audiences in a way that it really has meaning and creates a memorable immersive, rich experience for them to have. Yeah. And, and when you're, you touched on engagement, right? Everyone wants to improve engagement, but not everyone necessarily agrees on what this means or how to get there. Um, what does better engagement mean to you and your teams and National Geographic? Um, and then how do you, how do you measure it? How do you think about it? Yeah, I mean, like we touched on earlier, um, we we have definitely looked at at the ways that the different audiences engage with content and what their expectations are on certain platforms. So, you know, as I talked, as I referenced earlier, in terms of Instagram and these other platforms, we're really looking to bring motion into that space. It's just not engaging for people to experience that in a sort of series of flat, still images. Um, but and I also think for us, we've thought a lot about narrative storytelling that, you know, new technology, new tools in our toolkit are just tools and even possibly gimmicks if we're not really thinking about how to use them in a meaningful way. And I think that here at National Geographic, what we've done for 133 years is tell stories, narrative stories through visuals. And so really making sure that we hold on to that narrative experience. But we've also thought a lot about as I talked about earlier, what are the things that are unique to each of these platforms and how do people engage with that content there? So like I referenced with Everest and with Mars, we built in this capacity to take a selfie because we knew that was something that was really kind of inherent to these platforms. Um, another really successful and fun project that we did last year was we had a photographer, Laurent Balesta, who spent 
almost 30 days um, underwater in the Mediterranean, um, making beautiful images under the sea. And he came back up and we did a series of Instagram stories where in the first story, we directly engaged our audience and asked them to say, to tell us, what questions do you want to ask Laurent, who just spent 30 days under the sea? And we got thousands of questions and our editors went through them and we curated it down to a short list. And then we did a second Instagram story where we actually had Laurent on camera answering those questions. So, so really paying attention to what makes each of these channels and each of these distribution platforms unique and seeing how engagement can be amplified there um, has been critically, critically important to us. It sounds like the, the way to sort of tell or to tell more authentic stories and build better connections is just to sort of understand, right, each platform audience and to just be authentic in that delivery, which, um, you know, is something, I mean, I think you know, why National Geographic is so beloved, right? There is just an inherent authenticity to the work um, and um, and built-in sort of connections um, thanks to that. Um, so looking ahead, <laughs> crystal ball question, um, what new technologies or innovations um, excite you most? Is the team Are the teams thinking about, and if you have any guesses on what the, the next five years might look like for visual media and immersive experiences in particular, <laughs> like where we've gone and where, um, you know, is it just exploring new places or are you thinking about the way in which to deliver those stories? Yeah, I think this is something we're thinking about kind of all the time here. As I mentioned earlier, you know, we're at National Geographic, we for decades have been really thinking about taking people to the farthest reaches of the world. But, you know, as I touched on before, we're really engaging with these new technologies to, to be able to make that content more accessible to certain individuals. Um, we've talked about, you know, being more environmentally friendly um, and, and also really inspiring that explorer and everyone and and having that kind of educational component um, to the storytelling and, and really trying to figure out how to meet audiences where they're at, you know, but over the past number of years, we have um, really... Uh, had a lot of conversations about the, the difference between augmented reality and virtual reality and the ability to deliver uh, in our virtual reality experiences. We absolutely feel that these are the most immersive way to deliver these visually rich experiences is in headset where you are actually transported to another world. Um, we spent some time a few years ago creating a four-part VR series where we were able to take people on a 18-day expedition with um, Dr. Boys, a scientist, um, and you were able to come safely face-to-face -face with lions um, and elephants and giraffes. That's not something I'd really... Uh, necessarily do on my, you know, in reality, um, but it felt pretty cool to be able to do that in headset. However, the downside of VR, of course, is that the headsets are still fairly expensive for a lot of people, and um, it makes the, the audience for that content just much narrower. So that's why we here at National Geographic have really leaned into the opportunity of delivering experiences through AR, where we're able to reach a much broader audience through our Instagram feed and, and having that reach of 180 million plus people. Um, and, and I think for all of us as creators, it's thinking about, you know, how do we make people comfortable in these, in these immersive experiences as we go into the future? So uh, VR may be the most immersive way to deliver that content, but you can still have a really dynamic experience through augmented reality and even through 360 video. And I think that we have as a responsibility as creators to really keep creating the best experiences that we can across all of these platforms so that we can get our audiences comfortable engaging in this content and that it will always be maybe um, a kind of continued dynamic between augmented reality for the masses and maybe more niche experience in VR that are place-based um, experiences. In terms of new tech, I know that a lot of the tech companies are continuing to talk about wearables. Um, and this is a space that really um, excites me. You know, I am old enough to remember a time when we did not have iPhones. Um, and to just think back at how much 
the iPhone has changed the way that we consume content, the way that we all move through the world, the way that we experience ourselves in each place, but also the way that we experience the rest of the world, wearables could have a equally transformative um, uh, change, I think, on all of us over the next five to 10 years, um, depending on where that tech goes. So that's something that we are watching very closely and um, are really thinking about as we create content now, thinking about making our assets that we collect future-proof or as future-proof as we can so that we'll be able to utilize those assets now in augmented reality experiences delivered through Spark AR on Instagram. But we'll also be able to use those assets in the future um, as part of wearable delivered experiences or even part of place-based experiences um, in virtual reality. I love that. I feel like we've, you know, we've been talking about wearables for a long time now, and it feels like we are at this place, right, where, um, you know, accessibility and as costs come down for these devices, um, that more and more people will be able to sort of benefit from and experience these things. Um, all right. So we have one final question before going to the audience for questions. Um, what advice do you have for visual storytellers? Um, we have <laughs> Um, you know, all kinds of creators and brands and publishers in the audience, and we're all looking to build more meaningful connections. Um, it's only getting noisier. And yes, while there are, you know, more platforms and more ways in which to connect, it can sometimes feel, I think, overwhelming. Um, so what advice do you have? Um, that's also a big question, Julie, but I, I think sort of touching on something that you mentioned earlier um, that I think about personally, but I also think about certainly for the brand of National Geographic is just being true to the elements that make your brand, whether that's yourself or your company's brand, authentic, right? That we have to, even as new tech emerges um, and as the space gets more crowded, you know, it is about what makes each of us unique and each of our companies unique that is going to continue to engage audiences um, and when they're looking for that something, something special. Um, I would also say, of course, we all have to be willing to be nimble and evolve and just kind of be able to lead teams and, and motivate our colleagues to be able to um, get excited about where things are going and be able to to kind of be experimental and and try things but be willing to then shift if that's not working or if it needs to be adjusted a little bit and lastly i would just say which i mentioned earlier um you know i, I think there's a lot of new technologies that are appealing and um, it can be tempting to want to try them all out at once um but they really don't to really think carefully about how these new technologies or these new tools that we have in our toolkit actually enhance the storytelling, actually enhance the authenticity of the storytelling. And are they true to your brand? Because it's very easy to just engage with these new tools and this new technology in a way that is gimmicky. And I think in the end, that is not um, how we're going to connect authentically with our audiences. Yeah, for sure. For sure. All right. We have, um, we have lots of questions coming in about AR experiences, um, Mars Rover in particular. Mm -hmm. um, the first question is such an amazing example of using AR. How do you measure engagement for this type of media? Um, you know, we, we are using a lot of this content as an extension of our storytelling. So Mars was a, a large piece that we also did in the magazine and did across our digital storytelling. Um, so we measure it really in terms of, you know, expanding the reach of our audience and, and how many people are directly engaging with that content. I don't have the exact number on the Mars experience, but as I mentioned with Everest, we had you know, more than 50 million people actually engage and take a selfie. So that's a pretty big audience and something that we felt, you know, pretty good about for that kind of experience. All right. We have at least a few more AR questions. So um, obviously a hot topic. Um, what's the production process like for these experiences? Can you take us through what it, what it looks like? 
Yeah, so we have a great, um, we have big storytelling teams here at National Geographic that go across platforms from uh, a story team consists of a um, an editor for the text and a writer often, um, a photo editor who is really more akin to an executive producer of a film, I like to say. Um, they are really there every step of the way from the beginning of the project, pitching the idea, doing research and development on what the idea is, where, how best to tell that story. Um, we then have producers on the team who are specifically engaging in how to push this content out across these various platforms. Um, and there's a lot of, you know, conversation about, okay, wh what do we have access to in terms of the best, what is the best story to tell? What do we have access to in terms of the storytelling? What are the parameters that we're up against? So in the case of delivering this content on um, Instagram Spark AR platform, we're really limited in the size of files that we can deliver. The entire experience has to be less than five megabytes. So that doesn't give us the opportunity in some cases to tell the most visually rich or most narrative experience that we might want to, um, which is again, why we're thinking about making all those assets future-proof so that we can build these in different ways down the line. Um, and, you know, in the case of the Mars Rover, we also rely on outside partners. So we were indebted to the conversations that we had with the scientists from NASA um, and who built the cameras on the Mars Rover um, to help us think about how we would, how the images would be coming back from Mars um, and how we could integrate that authentically into this experience. It's, it's really a different process for each particular experience. But what I would say is at the core of it is a, you know, rich storytelling team across multi-platforms um, and a huge amount of research put into the storytelling, both from a content perspective and a technical perspective. Yeah, I think um, there's there are so many good questions in here. I'm trying to like... <laughs> All right. I love this one. Um, there are so many beautiful places in the world. Um, what are your top three um, to see in person or that have been uh, photographed by National Geographic? Uh -huh. That's a good question. Um, well, I am... Um I'm, I'm dying to go to Antarctica. So um, we do have a Nat Geo trip there. So maybe I can get on that at some point, um, you know, and it's a lot of fun and, and you, you get to really experience, um, you know, kind of experience the, the whole thing and to be able to take pictures as well. I'm really interested in going there. Um, I actually had the, um, I had the, uh, opportunity to go to Syria before the wars. And it was the old, the old city there was one of the most um, beautiful places that I have ever experienced. Um, and I had a really connected with some local artists there. And I just felt that that was a, like a incredibly historically rich, visually rich place um, to have been able to travel to. And I don't know what my next third one would be. <laughs> Hard to narrow it. <laughs> um are hey, there <laughs> yeah <laughs> take me with you um are there this one's similar but are there are there topics places or or people that you feel need to be shown more um or what stories um do you want to tell most I guess personally for, at the magazine mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah that's a great question I mean I think um, as I mentioned earlier, our, our storytelling and our storytellers have really um, shifted over the last number of years. And again, that was something that was accelerated by the pandemic. Um, and so as much as we are pitching stories here from headquarters, we're also really listening to our storytellers and our contributors who are based all over the world and, and listening to them in terms of what stories do they think are most important to tell um, on the ground in their own communities? Um, what is resonating with audiences, local audiences there as well? And um, I think that this is really, um, it, it makes our storytelling much more rich when we are a, you know, um, we are truly a global publication. I mean, we have massive brand recognition. You can travel pretty much anywhere in the world and people know what National Geographic is. So to have our contributors and our stories also reflect um, what audiences 
our, our living around the world, I think is a big plus for us. Um, and then of course there are certain topics that are just inherently Nat Geo. I mean, we've been thinking a lot about, um, oceans will forever be a topic that is interesting to national geographic. It's also obvious a place that has been, um, deeply unexplored here on earth. Um, and it's one that we are really excited about showcasing through both AR and VR experiences and brings a particular challenge for our AR and VR producers as they try to think about how to bring these underwater experiences to life in a way that really transports you there. Um, so that's kind of next up on our, I would say, sort of on our AR VR bucket list is to create a immersive oceans experience that really takes you through time. That would be so cool. <laughs> um, I, I think we have time for one more question. Um, and someone's asking, do you have plans to open up um, store locations to do to offer these AR VR experiences like in studio for people? Oh, that is interesting. Um, not that I'm aware of, but that is a good idea. Whoever asked that question. Um, we have... Um, in some cases, well, a couple of things. One, we have a, a theater here at headquarters where we, well, pre-pandemic and again in the future, I'm sure we'll have live events. Um, and we have actually hosted some of those live events have included VR experiences where we've had, you know, 450 headsets and the whole audience at once goes to the Okavango in headset. And then you take the headset off and you engage with the scientist who's actually there in the theater with you. And then everyone puts the headset on again and travels again to the Okavango. So that's been a really dynamic way to, to share that kind of storytelling with a slightly larger audience. We've also, um, you know, education is really important to National Geographic. So we have a couple of kits that we actually take around to local schools where we allow them to experience these experiences, these VR experiences as well. And of course, National Geographic is now part of the Walt Disney Company. So, hey, there could be opportunities to experience some of this content in parks in the future. Stay tuned. I love that. Let's let's put this. Um, yeah, thanks for the great question. Let's put this idea in motion. Yeah. I think those of us were, you know, that um, have not been able to travel for a very long time, um, we're probably thinking about all the ways, all the places we want to go and the ways in which we want to get there. Um, so I think that's all we have time for today. Whitney, this was such a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me, Julie, and thanks for having me, ImageCon, and um, thanks for the great questions from the audience. It's been, it's been a fun conversation. Yes, thank you to our audience. Thanks so much for joining us. We hope you'll stick around and enjoy the rest of the event. And uh, bye, everybody. Have a great day.